Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight a distinguished soldier, airman, and scholar, but who is also a longtime friend of our organization. Colonel Lee Burcham spent his earliest years in Illinois and was drafted at age 18 and was commissioned in October 1944 in the Army Air Corps. Subsequently, he, threw, he flew 28 missions over Germany as a B-24 navigator. Separated from the service in December 1945, Colonel Burchin re returned home where he earned BS and MS degrees from the University of Illinois. He re-entered the Air Force as a regular officer in August 1948 and was assigned to the Berlin Airlift Task Force where he flew about 60 missions to Berlin from the Rhine Main Air Base in Frankfurt, Germany. Later assignments, and you'll forgive me, this is a bit lengthy, but I think it will help you understand and respect the distinguished career that this man holds. Later assignments were with the Strategic Air Command, the Air Force Academy as Professor of Geography, Headquarters, 5th Air Force in Japan, Headquarters Air Force at the Pentagon, Denver University Graduate School of International Studies as a Senior Research Fellow, in Thailand and Vietnam as a Chief Targeting Officer for the Electronic Barrier, and then as the Director of Targets for B-52 strikes. He then returned to Headquarters Air Force, serving as Editor-in-Chief for the Project Corona Harvest, a large documentation of the war in Southeast Asia, and finally as the Senior Air Force Officer in charge of hospital reception of the returning POWs from Vietnam. He earned a Ph.D. at the University of Maryland in Geography and taught at both Maryland and Shippensburg until 1996. He is, as I mentioned, a longtime friend of our organization, having been a longtime volunteer with us uh, in the Military History Institute. He is also a member of the Kiwanis Foundation and Area Literacy Councils. If you've bought blueberries in about the last decade here in Carlisle, Colonel Burcham probably made that possible for you. We're also pleased tonight to welcome some very special guests. First, Colonel Burcham's wife, Carmen, his daughter, Anita, and their good friend, Dr. George Ryan. Welcome. Now, if you read the flyer, you know that the Burchams have been married for an astounding 65 years. I say astounding because I'm not nearly that close. When I remarked to him how amazing that was, he told me that they've remained together for so how how they've remained together for so long. He has two clippings on his refrigerator that provide great advice for the husband. One, no husband has ever been shot while doing the dishes. <laughs> And when you're wrong, admit it. When you're right, shut up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Lee Burcham. <clears throat> well, thanks for all those kind words. Good evening to all of you. And welcome to our discussion this evening of the greatest humanitarian endeavor ever undertaken. Undertaken on behalf of two and a half million German citizens who happen to live in the western sectors of Berlin and who had become besieged by the Soviets to convince them to turn in their uh, passes and their fortunes and come with the Soviets. And this occurred almost to the day, three years after the end of World War II in Europe. Now, this is about my 100th presentation of this. I think it's number 94. I've lost, lost track a bit. But the point of stating that is that I've learned quite a few things in giving this, this talk. One of them is that I have been questioned vehemently, severely, about my assertion that there was something called World War II by distinguished service groups in this community. Uh, astounding as that may seem, it really happened. Uh, complete disavowalment of the, the occurrence of World War II. Now, if you can't believe that there was a World War II, you're going to be lost tonight. So I'm going to get into uh, a discussion of things that ha occurred after World War II. Let me tell you how I'm organized now. 
I'm going to give you a little historical backdrop to what, uh, what happened, which gave us opportunity to per perhaps preclude what eventually occurred. Some thoughts on the occupation. How are we going to occupy Germany? The geography of that occupation, how we were, how we were situated in terms of territorial uh, occupation. Uh, the, then the character of the blockade that the Soviets imposed upon us. Then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the organization of assets available for an airlift and the decision processes that were made and by whom. And finally, an airlift organization and operation which will take up perhaps the last 30 minutes of my talk. At the very end, I'll give you a summary of the operations, which will take about a minute and 30 seconds to remind you of what I've been talking about. Let's back up from the airlift time, 48 and 49, and let's go back to the early years of World War II, when I think the most important conference that was held was in Tehran, in Iran, in 1943, during the month of November, 28th to the 30th of November, it was called Eureka, where President Roosevelt, Mr. Churchill, and Stalin met. And at this conference, they were primarily concerned with how are we going to defeat the Germans, but with some talk about what's going to happen after we defeat them. The next important one was the Yalta conference in 1945, in January, as I recall. Uh, down in the Crimea Peninsula, where again Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin meant, met and began to hammer out some of the characteristics of what was going to take place in Germany after its defeat. Subsequently to that time, to that conference, after the war had terminated, and immediately after it terminated, about a month later we had a meeting of those same individuals again at Potsdam, Germany, a suburb of Berlin. And at Potsdam, by the way, I'm using cheat cards here to keep myself on track because this has so many tentacles and tangents that I can go out on. We can be here until 2 a.m. in the morning or until they turn the lights out if I don't stick by it. Um, what did the Pots Potsdam agreements do? Well, in a nutshell, they set up conditions whereby the Western powers would have access to their sectors of Berlin on land, by, by rail, by highway, by, and by canal. And in exchange for not having a, a, a piece of territory reach into Berlin from the Western sectors of Germany, the Soviets promised that we could have air corridors coming in also. Those air corridors were about 26 nautical miles wide, and you'll see later in, in a map here, we had three of those corridors. The um, establishment of a four-power council, which was supposed to iron out all the difficulties that we might encounter with people speaking three different languages or four different languages, uh, and with different agendas as to the occupation itself. We formalized the occupation boundaries at that time. So parts, which specific parts of Germany were going to be under American control, French, British, and Soviet control. There was no general agreement, though, on economic coordination. And this was the downfall, perhaps, the Potsdam agreements. But we did agree that Germany was to be treated as an entity and not as four separate um, sub-countries, let's call them. During the, during the war, and particularly in the latter couple of years of the war, a very popular plan for the ultimate control of Germany emerged in the United States. It was called the Morgenthau Plan. How many have heard of the Morgenthau Plan? Sure. The Morgenthau Plan was rather severe and because it intended to return Germany to an agrarian society. Um, immediately, it becomes apparent that we needed a recovered Germany to enhance the economies of France, of Belgium, of Netherlands, Luxembourg, 
Denmark and so forth to recover in concert because these economies didn't operate as individual entities before the war. The recovery of West Euro European economies would be deterred by the Morgenthau plan. And what we were stressing was the interdependence of the European economies and the necessity to get along once more. Uh, those of you who knew the, something about the economy of Europe before the war know that it was traditional for the Ruhr coals of Germany to pass to France in exchange for the iron ores of Lorraine. The Swedes gave us the iron ore from Karuna, sent it to Germany in exchange for Ruhr coal, that sort of thing. And it went on throughout many of the nations. The Soviets developed quite an empathy for the Morgenthau plan because this would tend to perpetuate West, Germans, West, West Europe's poverty. And it was an optimization of the potential for emergence of communism from the Urals to the English Channel. The US and the UK in particular recognized early on that this occupation of Germany was quite expensive. It was a drain on our economies. And the occupation costs were rather severe. And it was also obvious that the German currency at that time was worthless. What you could carry around in a bushel basket today took a pickup truck equivalent tomorrow. It had no value. Currency reform was essential to reinvigorate the German economy, which was necessary for West Europe's recovery. Without a German recovery economically, there would have been no recovery in Western Europe economically. Under President Truman, the Marshall Plan was formulated and implemented, and we invited the Eastern European bloc under the Soviet control at that time uh, to join in. Free money. The Soviets declined on behalf of Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary. And the Soviets were quite unwilling to see Eastern Europe re economies rapidly recover. Because again, this would deter, it would deter the, the promise of communism from the Urals to the English Channel. The Soviets viewed the recovery of Western Europe as de deleterious to their aims. In early 1948 then, after we've been stressing currency reform, which the Soviets didn't want to hear about, they began to oppose us, that us, the UK, the US, and the French, and the Four Power Council, on almost all issues about all things. And we began to have uh, harassment occurring on the landlines that we were entitled to bring freight and people into Berlin. We had a, a system whereby we were allowed 12 trains per day into Berlin, which was quite satisfactory for occupation purposes. But um, each person had a pass. And this pass was recognized by the Soviets. Well, suddenly, those passes were not recognized anymore. Now, remember what's behind all of this currency reform. And we found that um, the highways were, were broken up. The canals ran out of water. The railroads were, were inoperable. And there was no way to get into Berlin anymore. The... Uh, Urging was that if we could just agree not to change currencies, all these things would be retroactively uh, put in place again. But the ultimate goal was to force the Allies from Berlin because they viewed our presence in Berlin as one of in situ espionage, which it was. It was okay. So with that backdrop now, let's begin to take a look at the... Um, at uh, what really took place. This is West Germany. It's a sketch map that I made. But I think it, 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 it takes care of things for us. Netherlands and Belgium on the left. 
the sectors of Germany, the large one here on the right-hand side is the Soviet sector in which Berlin was situated geographically. These are the three corridors I told you about that had been uh, negotiated at uh, Potsdam. At various, I, well, I've lost my, lost my pointer, haven't I? I have various things there. S right there on that one, that's Fuelsbuhl. That's, a, that's an airfield in Germany which is British operated. Uh, off to the right a little bit, another small f, well, down a little bit, down, 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 back. Anyway, Fosberg, right there, Fosberg, and below it, Selly. Those are two airfields that the Americans operated out of from the British, from it, out of the British zone, Fosberg and Selly. They're quite close to Berlin. Down here in the down bond, center bottom, center bottom is Frankfurt, Germany. There, down center bottom, there you go. Right outside Frankfurt is Rhein-Main. Rhein-Main was the other big American airfield. So we had three airfields. Americans operated out of Rhein-Main at first at Frankfurt, Selly and Fosberg up in the British sectors. The British then operated out of a series of bases up there, uh, Fuhlsbüttel, Schleswig-Land, um, Juan, a few others. They had about four airfields they operated out of. The French really weren't in the act. They had two, C4, two C-47s in the, in the airlift, so we can forget about them for the time being. But we had the air corridors, the three air corridors. You went in the south corridor, you went in the north corridor, you went out the center corridor. This is so you didn't run into one another in that air traffic control zone in, in the center of Berlin. May I have the next slide, please? Okay. One thing I want to show you here is how the... There we go. This is a schem schematic diagram of the low frequency radio range. This was our means of aerial navigation in Europe as it was back in the United States at this time, 1948-49. A low frequency uh, range uh, which had quadrants in it. And you see at the top on the right hand side is dot it. This is Morse code it's transmitting. To the left of it is Dida. Now, if you superimpose those dida and dot it, you get a da, so you're on course for that leg of the range. And the alternate dot its and didots going around from N's and A's, N's and A's. You could adjust these legs however you wanted them for transmission purposes to direct the aircraft into what direction he wanted to go. These were necessary to give us a navigation system in Europe at that time. A few years later, all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of a sophisticated uh, system began to emerge, but at this time, this is what we operated with. May I have the next one, please? Now, this is to give you an idea of how big the airlift was. You know, did it carry a continent? Was it car did it occupy a continent? or a county or what? Well, it, it occupied the state of Pennsylvania. And if you would superimpose the cities again, you'd find down here in the lower left-hand corner, Pennsylvania, down southwestern Allegheny County, is Frankfurt, Germany. Up over here about where Wilkes-Barre Scranton is, is Berlin. And up about dead center in Pennsylvania there is, is Williamsport. So this is the magnitude of the area covered by the airlift. It wasn't a huge area, but it was, it was significant. The flying time, for example, from down here at, at um, Frankfurt into Berlin and back was 3 hours and 45 minutes. From Fosberg and Selly, those two bases up in the British sector, is like an hour and 20 minutes. So the advantages were, were very great to, to be flying out of Fosberg and Selly, but an, an, an enormous amount of tonnage came out of Rhine-Main. Now, given, given the circumstances here, we're now blockaded. We can't drive our vehicles, can't sail our boats, can't drive the trains, and we don't have very many airplanes. In fact, at this time, we had two, two, one, two, four-engine transports in the European theater of operations. Now, I hate to say this, but this is exactly what we did. 
Predominantly in this room, we are of Judeo-Christian faith. We, we followed the Judeo-Christian ethic after World War II, turn the other cheek, do unto that, you know. We did it, and it did it to us. We destroyed our aircraft. We took our aircraft out on the runways of Belgium and France and dynamite them after the war. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of aircraft we destroyed. So when this thing came along, we didn't have anything to do anything with. We were in a makeshift environment, to be sure. What were our options? We could acquiesce to the Soviet demands. President Truman, President Truman said, we will stay in Berlin. That's the final word. That's from the commander-in-chief. General Clay, who was the high, high commander there, wanted to ram an uh, uh, armored convoy into uh, Berlin on the Autobahn. The problem with that was we had two divisions in western Germany. The Soviets had 40 divisions in eastern Germany and 27 more in Czechoslovakia and Poland. The armored column wouldn't have worked, I don't think. We were outnumbered. Alternatively, we could organize an airlift to provide food and fuel for two and a half million people. All we have are a bunch of C-47s, a little two-engine transports which took us through the war. The option of an airlift, if we decided to have an airlift, the option for failure did not exist. That was a non-existent option. May I have the next slide, please? Number four. Number five, please. Okay, this is fine. It's fine. Before I get into anything else, this, this is Berlin. And this is the sectors. This is the Soviet sector on the right. On the left uh, is the American, British, and French sector. The French sector was at the top. The UK sector was down in the lower left-hand corner. And the, the American sector was right there. That's around Tempelhof Air Base. So we had Tempelhof Air Base over here on the right. On the left was Gatow in the, in the English sector. And up farther north there was Gatow in the French sector, an airfield which was built by German women. The German women broke up the rock. They hauled it in wheelbarrows, and they put the rock in place for the, for the sub uh, coatings or finishes for the, for the airstrip before we could macadamize it. The German women built Gatow Airfield, period. So we had those, those airfields to use. Around, dotted lines out around here is a 50 mile uh, radius. It's called the Berlin Air Traffic Control Zone. If you came into this air traffic control zone, allegedly the four power council at Tempelhof would be in control of your flight. But you could fly any place in that circle and be under air traffic control of Berlin. Now we'll see how that operated here a little bit later in, in my talk. Four power commitments begin to fail. We had nothing uh, from the Soviets at all in, in terms of cooperation from this point forward. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Let's see what we got here. What were we going to haul in? What did it take to feed two and a half million people? And what did it take to keep some of their industry going to keep people employed? Now, it's one thing to be occupying a number of people, two million people that don't have jobs. And it's another thing to be occupying a people who have jobs. The disenchantment factor gets very severe as jobs are lost or aren't there. We decided that based upon the labor of various portions of the, of the population, that these are the number of calories we had to put into the economy of Germany to sustain this population. How we did this now, and the, the commodities that we brought in, we'll show you a little bit later. But 
heavy workers, workers doing heavy work, were getting 2,600 calories per day. And there were some exceptions where this was exceeded. And these German women building this airfield at Gatau in the, t in the French sector, I'm sorry, at Tegel, at Tegel uh, were being fed like 3,000 calories per day. White collar workers got 1,800. There weren't very, very fat people in, in, in Berlin at this time. They really weren't. They, were, they tend to be on the slender side. Uh, we get down to the, the youngsters and they're dealing with 16, 1,700 calories. What were you going to bring in now that you could lift on by airlift to provide these calories to two and one half million people? Well, first of all, you've got to get yourself organized so that you can, you can begin to haul things in. Because right now we had two C-54s and we had a bunch of C-47s which could hold. The C-54, which we're going to dwell on here, is a 10-ton aircraft. We hauled in 20,000 pounds at each, each, each load, whatever it was, 20,000 pounds. The C-47 could hold about 3,000 pounds. So it took about seven C-47s to equal one C-54 uh, sortie into Berlin. We couldn't do it. Um, we had to organize an airlift. And I guess the first thing we had to do was to accumulate some C-54s around the world. We had about 275 of them in the Air Force inventory. The Air Force inventory, total inventory. 275 transports. So we set about to cull from Pacific forces, from the South, South Caribbean forces, from the Panama Canal Zone, from the Alaskan Command, all we gathered up all their C-54s, sent the C-54s to Germany along with the air crews and uh, that beca they became then the flyers on the Berlin airlift. But we'll get to this in just a minute. Um, second thing, it General, General uh, LeMay was at that time the commander of US forces in Europe. He had experience with a gentleman named Tunner, General Tunner on the hump over the, uh, in the CBI theater and the hump from India over to China during World War II. So General Tunner sort of knew how to run an airlift. Whereas it had been kind of haphazard up this time, see we worked our way now from about April, May, June, we're into about July now, and we still don't have any C-54s over there. So he established, as the C-54s arrived, he established rigid scheduled maintenance times. He set standards for crew flying hours. And the U.S. invoked a reservist recall of lots and lots of four-engine drivers from World War II who were sitting back here in the States in banks, uh, on farms, uh, in steel mills, and we recalled them to active duty because they had volunteered to stay in the reserve forces. And we established then a Berlin Airlift Task Force and finally, the Gilfillan Corporation developed a, a radar. A radar without which we could not have had at Berlin airlift. It was the Gilfillan Ground Controlled Approach Radar. This radar you don't want to have your neighbor in possession of because he could tell where you were within five feet of, of where you were standing. The Gilfillan GCA radar enabled our pilots to know whether they were five feet to the left of the landing plane, five feet to the right, five feet low, or five feet above it. Then we established beside the GCA and the airlift task force, we the manual labor teams were established, which optimized upon, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, with this scenario, we had vast numbers of displaced persons, DPs, from the Eastern Bloc, for the most part, and PWs, Polish workers, by the thousands in West Germany and in Berlin. And this became our manual labor force along with the German population. So we were not wanting for manpower. We had plenty of that. Uh, Let's see, slide number seven. Okay. I talked to you about the calories needed. Now, these were the daily foodstuff requirements and tons per day. 
to be delivered from the Western German sectors into Berlin over the airlift. Uh, yeast, three tons. Make bread, obviously. Get down here to potatoes, and we're, we're putting in 180, uh, more like 350 tons a day of potatoes. Potatoes being the mainstay carbohydrate source for uh, the population. A lot of cereals, sugars, dried skim milk, salt. You can read that. Um, don't let the scale fool you because it jumps from 180 to 646 over here all of a sudden for potatoes. So I was for flour and wheat, flour and wheat. 646 tons per day to feed the two and a half million people. Now, some might say, well, oh, this is all a bunch of junk. People, you just loaded whatever you had on the airplane and sent in. Not so. Let's look at this, for example. Most of the time that I flew, I carried coal. That coal was in gunny sacks, 100-pound gunny sacks. They leaked coal dust. And after a few flights, you had airplanes full of coal dust. Now let's just suppose you put 10 tons of coal in there, 5 tons of coal in there down the right side, and 5 tons of milled flour down the left side of the plane. And you get flour dust coming out. Now you mix flour dust and coal dust, and you know what you've got? You've got a small atomic bomb. Individually, they will blow up. If you've ever been around a flour mill that has blown up, you know it takes out a good chunk of the city. And coal dust, mines have this problem all the time. Very explosive. We had to be careful about what you loaded and where you put it. And so this then gave rise to um, a characteristic of Rhine Main, for example, providing mostly 90% of, of one commodity, one class of commodity. Selly might have another class of commodities. Fosberg, another. A good example is the British aircraft, the flying boats predominantly, flew in all of the petroleum, oil, and lubricants that were required by the West Berlin population and the armed forces of the Western powers. Let's look at the fleet acquisition. Um, we can, Michael. This is how we brought our aircraft in. You see, beginning in June, about 12 in from the canal zone. Now remember, we just had two of these things in the theater, just two. We're now building up our, our force so we can fly into Berlin. So we have 12 aircraft, nine more from Alaska, 11 more from Hickam, that's uh, Hawaii, and on down. You can see we're calling up from Bergstrom, from Moffat, Hickam, Tokyo, Kelly Air Base, and San Antonio, Texas, Travis in, uh, near San Francisco. And we're working our way up to 200, and we had 143 there. It continued, the augmentation continued into November and December when we finally reached a total of about 200, probably 250. I don't know if we ever really got an exact mark or not. 225, which were flying at any one time. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is about the C-54. For those of you who have, are mechanically interested in, in what the aircraft could do and what it was, how big it was, um, these are its characteristics. It was 93 feet long, 117 feet wingtip to wingtip. It had a maximum screw, uh, a cruise speed of 239 miles per hour. We didn't fly that fast, though. Uh, this aircraft was made to fly at 12,000 feet and under. You could fly it to 16,000 feet, but it was straining. It was not a high-altitude aircraft. It says max range 3,900 miles at 190 miles per hour, 5,400 pounds of payload. Well, we were taking 20,000 pounds of payload, so you can understand we can have a, <clears throat> a decrement here to our, to our range um, that we could get. And we rarely carried the full fuel load in. So these were the it, four engines, good, good engines, an extremely good aircraft for its day and for the purposes for what it was intended. This was the aircraft that United Airlines, Colonial Airlines, American Airlines, and all the Eastern Airlines flew in the 1940s in the United States. This was the mainstay aircraft before the DC-6 came along. The DC-6 came along about the end of the airlift time here, and we began to replace it with a newer aircraft. 
But this was not an oddball aircraft at all. We had lots of commercial liners. Let's look at the logistics plan here now. What are we going to do? Next slide, please. Oh, this is, this is a C-54. Four, forget it. That's what one looks like. Years and years later, I, I flew on Taiwan Airlines from Taipei down to uh, Weiling on, on the East Coast. And they had some C-54s that just absolutely sparkled. They were just immaculate aircraft. The engines sounded like they were jewels out there running. So you could do all kinds of things with this bird. And the Chinese hung on to it for a long time. Let's look at the next one, please. This is the execution now, the logistics plan. Who was involved? Baiko was the British, UCOM, European Command, US, the Allies, uh, and uh, here's uh, the, the array of bases. Y80 was Wiesbaden, RM is Rhein-Main, Fossberg, Selle, Fuhlsbüttel, Schleswig-Land, Lübeck, and Wunsdorf. And these were the American and the British and the French airfields in the western, western um, section of, of occupied Germany. You can see what, was, for, what we're stressing here is that out of Rhine-Main, for example, coal was about 90% of what we hauled. The rest of it was food, dried food, dehydrated foods. We didn't haul many bananas in or pineapples or anything like that. If we hauled in fruit, it was canned fruit, or it was dried fruit. Dried fruit was preferable because you could put that in gunny sacks. Um, if we look at um, schleswig Land, you see POL. I think it's the only POL up there, because the British flew all the petroleum oil and lubricants in, as I said before. So we sectorized the, 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 the loading process. And if you, can, if you could do this, and you had specialized loading equipment for each of these categories of things, and you had higher efficiency rate. Now there was a distribution of food and fuel, then down to the Berlin magistrate from the Tempelhof sector, that's American, the French, and the uh, British sector over here, Gatow. These commodities were input to the German economy. We didn't have any reason to hold anything back. And we were still working our ways towards getting out of starvation for the German population. Once we got the 225 aircraft in place and flying, how did we make this thing work? You didn't just launch a bunch of aircraft into the sky and say, head for Berlin. Um, when you took off, you climbed at a fixed climb rate. 500 feet per minute or 350 feet per minute or whatever it was. This was prescribed for the day from that airfield for all aircraft. You didn't climb faster than that. You didn't climb any slower than that. You climbed at that rate. Why? So you didn't run into one another. In bad weather, which was universal, the only kind of weather we had there was terrible. Um, we, had, we had three or four degrees of weather of I think they were classified here as, oh yeah, poor, unfit, impossible, and don't do it. <laughs> but uh, the objective was when we, we took off, you had to be able to see one runway light in daytime or night and pretend that you saw the second one because that was about one-eighth of a mile. And you needed one-eighth of a mile and 50 feet of ceiling to take off under instrument flight rules. Well, the pilots would say, gee, I think I see that first one, and if I see the first and the second one, it's got to be down there someplace, so let's go. So they did. We, we climbed out at fixed rates. We cruised at fixed rates. I didn't get to go at 180 knots, and the next person at 175. No, 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 no. Everybody went at 180. Or if you couldn't do to 180, you made a missed execution of, of mission return, went back to your base and landed, if for some reason you couldn't pull the power enough to do what we were supposed to do. We had staggered altitudes. The first plane off went to 6,000 feet. 
The next one went to 5,500 feet for his cruise. The next one went to 5,000 feet. The next one went to 5,500 feet. The next one went to 6,000 feet. And then it was stair step back and forth and, until you got all these aircraft at least 500 feet separated. Bear in mind, you're not seeing these other aircraft. They're up there in the sky someplace. And it's miserable. You can't see anything. You're in solid fog 90% of the time. So you have to fly on instruments and depend upon the rules of, of flight. So we had block scheduling too. The people didn't take off from Air Base A. At the same time, people from Air Base B were going to take off. You get into Berlin at the same time, no place to land because people are ready to, trying to, to get in there under instant flight rules. The access into Berlin was only via what we call the ground control approach system. And I'll give you a sample of that in a minute. Okay. Uh, as we approached this outer circle, you remember the dotted lines out around the, the Berlin air traffic control zone, we made contact with air traffic control in Berlin. Berlin air traffic control. Gave them our call sign, gave them our altitude, and they had CPS-5 radars which would then identify us. They'd say, make a 45 degree turn to the right, make it for one minute, make a turn back to the left for one minute, back to the left, you're back on course. We've identified you positively. Now you are tagged. You were given a number on that CPS-5, and you were tagged, and you're ready now to make your ground-controlled approach. And when you got into about 25 miles or 20 miles, you were turned over to the ground control approach radar. And what I want to do for you now is to give you a a condensed version of the transmissions that occurred from that ground control radio, radio, radar operator to the aircraft commander. Uh, the whole procedure probably took about seven minutes, six or seven minutes, depending on what your rate of descent was. This will take about two minutes, but it'll suffice to give you an example of what was said and what kind of control there that we had. Eastbound aircraft always had a call sign beginning in E. Westbound aircraft always in a W. In this case, it's Echo 365. You have been positively identified. At this time, complete your cockpit check for final approach. If for any 10-second period, any 10-second period, you fail to receive a transmission, execute the missed approach procedure, contact the Berlin Air Traffic Control and A-Channel for further instructions. That missed approach procedure meant you pulled up and got ready to go home. You will intersect the glide path in 20 seconds at which time establish a 700 feet per minute descent at your designated airspeed. Begin your descent. You are slightly right of glide path. Correct your heading. You are drifting back nicely and are 10 feet below glide path. Adjust your rate of descent. You are on the center line of glide path and are 10 feet below the glide path. Adjust your rate of descent. You are five feet below the glide path and slightly left of center line. Adjust heading. You're still 20 miles out. He's telling you're five feet too low to five feet too high. You are now on the glide path. You are approaching the end of the runway. You are on glide path and on center line. You are five feet above the runway. You're over the end of the runway. Take over visually. That problem. You haven't seen anything yet. We're going to freeze this for just a little bit here. Freeze this scenario. Each one of you is in the pilot's seat. You have five seconds in which to decide, am I going to put this bird down on the ground, which I think is down here. It's five feet below me someplace, but I haven't seen any lights yet. Or are you going to pull up and go home? Those are your two options. And so the first second goes by, the second second goes by. You see anything yet, Mike? No. Third second goes by, co-pilot says, I got a light over here. Good. He takes the controls. Do you see a second light? No. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Good. We got two runway lights. We can land. And about that time, <laughs> wheels hit the ground. This was the ground controlled approach. Believe me, this will take you in in absolute total blinding fog. And the only thing I can say is that 
you, you start get against the ground each time, you know. Gee whiz, we made it again without crashing. So that's what the GCA was. This enabled those aircraft to bring in those 7,500 tons per day that were needed to sustain the population of, of uh, uh, Berlin. I mentioned that uh, these takeoffs were IFR, and we, we, we sort of stretched the limits quite, quite often. Once in a while, you got up in the air, and you didn't have a place to land. What do you do? Where do you go? Say you're returning home from, from uh, Temple Hop, you're going to Rhine Main, and everything's closed. You're checking all the channels. Rhine Main's closed. Uh, Wiesbaden's closed. First and Feldbrook's closed. Oberfaffenhofen's closed. All the fields in Germany are closed. Brussels is closed. Le Bourget in, in, in France is closed. Where am I going to land? In flight service in Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt uh, IG Farben building, there was up in the top floor, there was a little company called Flight Service. Yes, for Flight Service. And they searched diligently to find an open airfield. On this one night, which I'll tell you about, if we could we go back to the, um, to the map just a minute, um, Michael? Back about number two. Dead center here, you can see a K. That's, uh, yeah, that's Castle. That's Castle in Germany. Just to the northwest there, about 20 miles, is a little field called Fritzlar. Fritzlar was a, um, it didn't have a paved runway. It had a pierced steel planking runway. And about the heaviest thing that had ever been in there was a C-47 tw twin engine. Mostly it was Piper Cubs and, and uh, uh, planes that did uh, observation, reconnaissance observation for us. But I looked down as we passed over Fritzlar and I said, hey, there's an open airfield. And Fritzlar had a beacon which you could close in on. So we contacted the Fritzlar Tower, and after a few minutes, somebody rustled around and answered. We said, we're coming in. He said, well, gee, we don't have any room for C-54s. You're going to have room for them now. <laughs> so we sat down at C-54 at Fritzlar. We were the first one in, rolled to the end of the runway, and taxied off, hopefully on solid ground, didn't quite know, because we had 67 more birds up there looking for a place to land. We put 62 of them into Fritzlar that night. I think the commanding officer there, who was a colonel, I, I suspect he was about 65 years old, I think he had apoplexy and retired that night uh, because he couldn't, he couldn't believe what, was, what he was seeing. He'd never seen any, first of all, he'd never seen his C-54 come into land there. And 62 of them, no, 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 no way. But we put them wingtip to wingtip in there. Got something to eat, got a night's sleep, woke up the next morning, and the fog had lifted. Off we went. So that's, that's what we did. And we put aircraft in as far as Marseille. One night we got a couple of them down to Algeria. We got them down into Spain. We got them into Oslo and Norway. We got them up into Stockholm in Sweden. Any place we could find a field that was open, we'd put the aircraft into. Let's look at the airlift activity by month. I think it's number 11, uh, Stephen. Number, number 12. This is what we hauled by, by month. UK, look at the totals. Those are important, the green ones up there. Uh, you notice beginning in June, we were down here to um, less than 1,000 tons that month, 500 tons. We rapidly climbed up to about 4,500, which was bare subsistence, but ultimately starvation levels for the German population. Then once we, th that was because in, in the month of September, October, November, the weather just was unbelievably bad, unbelievably bad. Um, aircraft were canceled out when there was, you couldn't see that first runway light. It wasn't there, so you couldn't take off. And the, the freight tonnage we hauled in there suffered badly. Then we got the GCA in there and you can see what happened to the tonnages as they went up. Let's look by commodity type. Now one more, please. Yeah. Look how much coal we hauled in as a total of the, uh, as a percentage of the total. About 85% of what we hauled was coal. 
And that was to provide fuel for the electric energy uh, generating facilities in western sectors of Berlin to run machinery, probably at Siemens and companies like that, making small items that didn't use a whole lot of electric power. Electric power to the German population was about 45 minutes to an hour and a half a day. One of the things as a navigator that we were constantly charged with doing was checking on, are the Soviets really trying to mess us up? Are they trying to interfere with us in, in a severe fashion? Are they, are they messing around with those legs of the low frequency ranges that I spoke of? And there were things that the navigator, navigator could do that the pilots didn't have time to do. Another thing that went on at the same time was that, and you say, why didn't the Soviets stop us? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Very quietly, but with a proper amount of announcement being made, the United States government moved three groups of B-29s into three British bases on the island of Great Britain at Marham, Lake and Heath, and Sculthorpe. A number of these B-29s had silver noses. Guess what the silver nose meant? These were atomic bomb-armed bomb aircraft. Each day, the silver noses increased. Whether we got more bombs or not, I don't know. But the number of silver noses increased because the Russians, the Russians were watching the British bases. And we hope they sent the right information back to them. The other thing, we didn't get a lot of interference from Soviet flyers because they were very poor instrument flyers. At this point in, in their history, they were not instrument flight pilots. The Soviets would not allow the pilots out of their ground control intercept range, so they had to keep positive control over them. We succeeded then on, on uh, by Easter Sunday, it started I guess on Good Friday, and we flew in um, about 14,000 tons of commodities. We followed that up on Easter Sunday with another 14,000 tons plus. Now that's more than enough to feed Berlin. We were putting a strain on the aircraft and on the crews to be sure, but we wanted to make a, a show of the fact that we could do this. And the Soviets knew that coming down the line in a few more months, the C-72 was coming along the C-82 was already there. We were having m mathematically enormous increases in our potential to airlift coming downstream within a year. So it, it, um, it followed that they thought they'd put an end to all this. They'd worn out excuses for why the roads didn't operate and the railroads wouldn't operate and there wasn't any water in the canals and everything anymore. And so they agreed that um, uh, we, could, we could resume normal uh, shipments by, by ground along about the 1st of May of 1949. At that point, we were regularly flying in around 9,000 to 11,000 pounds, I'm sorry, tons per, per day. Uh, now, I want to conclude with one other slide I have here. Yeah, number 14, please. Now, this is a, not a very good... A friend of mine, an artist, I, I asked Norma, I said, please draw a picture for me of a C-54 coming down between apartment buildings. Because I'd done about 40, 45 missions into Berlin. It had all been at night. You, all, you always landed in complete, total darkness. There were no lights on in the city at all. You never saw anything. And suddenly on Good Friday, this is what I saw, and I said, ye gods, uh, how long have those buildings been there? <laughs> and the pilot says, I don't know, I never saw them before either. <laughs> and that's the way that went. Um, we liter I had literally never seen a building. I didn't, know, I didn't know these buildings were either side of us. They weren't quite that severe, but we did come down between apartment buildings at Tempelhof Approach. Um, Early on, very, very early on, the first month or so, a C-47 took out one of those apartment buildings. It crashed into it for some reason, don't know why. But we succeeded in, in freeing up um, the problems of the West Berliners. Now, I've thrown a lot of data to you and had a lot of words, 
And let me just give you a very brief summary now of what I've talked about and what was achieved as a result of this, which I call the, the greatest effort, a humanitarian effort ever undertaken. These numbers may be mind-boggling to you, but digest them. Number of flights into Berlin, 277,569. This is one year. Began about 1st of uh, May, ended about the 1st of May. Tonnage we flew in, 2,326,000 tons. We flew 81,000 tons out, which was probably manufactured goods by the West German industries. We flew into and out of Berlin a quarter of a million passengers. A lot of these were on business with, with the government. We lost 22 aircraft. We had some fatalities. The United States lost 31 persons in, in accidents. The United Kingdom lost 18 uh, military persons and 21 civilians. The Germans lost 15 persons, and I think these were all ground force workers. Walked into props or stuff like that. Uh, we fed between 2.3 and 2.5 million Berliners for one year. No one got fat, but they all stayed uh, uh, healthy and, and, and uh, reasonably well fed. We employed, we kept employed tens of thousands of German workers by hauling in the coal. Our costs at that time were in US dollars $253 million for the airlift and for $42 million for the United Kingdom. I think most importantly of all, we avoided a nuclear war with the Soviets. That was the most important thing. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my briefing, and uh, I'll entertain any questions that you might have. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, if you would, please just raise your hand. We have a microphone on each side of the room, and we'll get around to you. Please don't ask your question until we can get to you. If your question is important enough to ask Colonel Bircham, it's important enough for all of us to hear and also be recorded on camera. So if you would please just raise your hands, we'll get to you. Yes, sir, in the back, come on. Sir, thanks for your presentation. I'm Vance Stewart. I'm in uh, Seminar 5 at the War College. Could you describe a, a little bit of your uh, uh, once you arrived at the airfield in Berlin, the time on the ground, how fast they unloaded, and how soon you took off again? Thank you. Sure can. Uh, typically, let, let's say this was a, a reasonable day when the, you, know, you, could, you could land and not be in the fog all the way. And aircraft were landing at about, um, let's say, six-minute intervals. Now, when you landed, you, you went out, you taxied to the end of the runway and went off onto, the, onto a parallel strip and that you were stopped at a particular point. At about that time, the crew chief went to the back of the airplane, opened the doors, and about that time, a thud when the long-bedded truck backed up and hit your aircraft, ready to unload. These, the beds of these trucks were about the length of an 18-wheel uh, semi-trailer. On that, on that flatbed truck, there were perhaps 30 PWs and displaced persons. About 10 of them would get on and they formed a human uh, chain picking up the 100 pound sacks of coal, macaroni, oatmeal, whatever it was, and passing them down. Each would have two chains going down. Typically the 10 tons would take about six minutes. And we'd, we'd be handed a, a flight clearance to the pilot about that time. And when the last Gunny sack was off, the doors closed, the truck pulled away, the engine started on the left side again, and off we went. We were usually on the ground about 15 minutes. Now, on Good Friday, when I went in there, this is kind of hard to, to, to believe, but we were, we were not flying at six minute intervals, we were flying at about one minute intervals into Berlin. And um, 
we pulled off onto the taxi strip, and by the time we got to this taxi strip, the, the bang on the door, then the doors opened, and off went the, the produce, and in six minutes flat, we had a, a clearance to fly, and eight minutes flat, we were on the runway, and in 10 minutes flat, we were in the air. It depended upon the weather. This was all weather control, really. Uh, sir, did you ever meet General Tunner? I know he was in Korea, but I just wonder what he was like. Did you ever talk to him or ever get addressed uh, by I, him or anything like that? I did not meet General Tunner. I understand he was a rather terse indiv individual, a little bit difficult to get along with, but there was a running feud between General Tunner and um, uh, uh, General Cannon. When General Cannon uh, succeeded General May as Commander-in-Chief of European Forces, he was left with General Tunner, who had been LeMay's nominee and, and appointee for the airlift, and he really couldn't re replace him with anyone, but he had to digest the fact that General Tunner was not his choice. Over here first. And you, sir. Lee, you alluded to the experience the senior staff had with the uh, Chinese airlift during the war. Was there any effort to do a lessons learned capture from, say, the German experience flying into Stalingrad? Well, I think they did use lessons learned. Tuner brought it with him, uh, and one was the uh, the strict the strict maintenance schedule, so you didn't have a lot of downed aircraft going out to the end of the strip to take off, and couldn't because of engine problems. The second one was a very strict in-flight regimen of you will fly at this speed, at this altitude, at this rate of climb. Those things were carried over from the days in the hump, I know that. Um, I don't think you, could, you, could, you couldn't forget those lessons learned, I'm sure, but there was, they, they had to work themselves out in special ways in, in the different theater of operations, for sure. I'm not sure whether I've asked your, answered your question or not, but it's, it was, for a while there was sort of feel as you go, and, and until Tuner got there, really, we didn't have any system to speak of. And things changed dramatically when he got hold of things. What happened with General Tuner was that on the first, second, or third day he was up there, he took a flight into Berlin. And he couldn't get down on the ground because they were stacked about eight or ten aircraft high, going up to 10,000 feet. And nobody could get a clearance into the, into the airfield because they couldn't clear out the next guy. The visi visibility was so bad. And he says, this is not going to happen again. So he gave a call sign over the air and directed Berlin Air Traffic Control to tell all aircraft to return home. So on that day, they all returned home. The next day, they had a whole new set of rules to abide by as to how to, how to perform and what to do. This is when these controlled um, parameters for rate of climb, crews, that sort of thing, emerged. Sir. In my Air Force days, they talked about MIGI uh, which was mimicking interference, jamming, and intrusion as ways of getting you off course on the radio. Uh, you talked a little bit about, uh, about Russian interference. Do you have any more you want to talk about with regards to them trying to get you out of the uh, corridors? It was often alleged that they were trying to do that very thing. And if, we, if they could get us out of the corridors, then technically we were susceptible to being shot down because we were intruding into Soviet territory. Uh, all the flight in-flight checks I made with our low-frequency beacons and, 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 and ranges failed to show that, that was, they were being bent in any way. Um, I've read a lot about the alleged things that happened, but whether they were really material or not, I'm, I'm not sure. Because I, I, in, in my, all my flying, I, I failed to find any real interference from the Soviets. What the Soviets wanted to happen was for the airlift to fail on its own, which they were convinced it was going to do. They didn't believe we could organize anything like we did. And um, so they were not apt to interfere too, too formally, let's say, um, with our operations. They wanted them to fail on their own. Ma'am, over here, you had a question? Sir, please.
you talked about the B-29s. I'm assuming they were in the air 24 hours a day. How close did we ever get to having them do something like uh, atomic weapons? Uh, they were not in the air 24 hours a day. Um, they were pretty much uh, uh, airfield bound. They did take their necessary training flights. How close were we? If the Soviets had done the wrong thing, if they had decided to take those 40 divisions and go to the English Channel the next day, which they probably could have done, we were this close, this close to a nuclear war. Didn't happen. And I don't think the Soviets wanted a nuclear war on top of what they just suffered from World War II. Um, it would have been no good to anybody, really. It's over here. Thank you, sir, for being here. I have a two-part question. I read a story once about a woman who was a German child during the airlift, and she remembered fondly receiving candy from America. And I'm wondering if you know if that was a very rare occasion for us to think of, you know, that's kind of an extra thing in this sort of circumstance. And then the second part is, um, do you have any personal stories of meeting people who lived in the city during that time? And if so, would you share one that's meaningful to you? Well, let me take the last one first. Uh, no, I, my typical ground time was 15 minutes. I never got off a of Temple Air, Air Force Base. Um, I didn't meet any German people in, in Berlin because the air crews just didn't leave their aircraft. We stayed right with them. Going back to the candy, I think you're, you're alluding to the candy bomber. There was a Lieutenant Gail Halverson. Oh, this is a story I meant to tell you. Lieutenant Gail Halverson made his approach over into Tempelhof, and it's that famous painting... So on this little booklet here, it shows the aircraft landing over this raised berm at the end of the Tempelhof uh, runway. He watched all these little kids. He said, maybe we'll throw them some candy bars tomorrow. So he went out and spent his own money, bought a bunch of candy bars and got some cheap cotton handkerchiefs and tied them to them, made parachutes out of them. And as they approached the, the end of the runway, he tossed out these candy bars on these parachutes. Well, the kids... There were probably three dozen kids down there that day. They really thought this was great. Well, the next day, there weren't three dozen kids. There were about 15 dozen kids down there. <laughs> and the next day, there were more kids down there. And he kept throwing this candy out. And he was, he was, walk, he was walking on, on eggshells. So he didn't quite know whether he was doing the right thing or not. Well, he got a call. He got a call from the commander of, of U.S. Air Forces in Europe to come in and see him. And he says... Sir, he says, you have made a diplomatic coup. He says, we have worked and worked and worked probably to persuade the German people that we're on their side, and you did it all in one day. Go at it. So then they funded him. They gave him some money, a little bit, out of welfare funds, and they found some cotton handkerchiefs someplace, and they started tossing out the candy on a regular basis going into Tempelhof. I think that's what you were referring to. That's the candy that the British, that the uh, Berliners got. Sir, we have one here. Um, I just wanted to add, because I'm from Germany, visiting a friend from Germany in Carlisle, and uh, it relates to the question the lady had. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that your, the airlift did really leave a huge impact also on later generations, which we found out today. Both of us were very touched when we learned about it at school especially knowing that it was mainly political and economic reasons, but it was only three years after such a terrible war. And, uh, yeah, we really like you. And thank you for doing this, exactly this, uh, taking this risk. My pleasure. Your personal life. My pleasure. Thanks. I believe we had um, one up front and another in the rear. Who's got it? I was just wondering, at that time the Berlin Wall wasn't in place. No. And um, what was the reaction, or the interaction, I should say, between those in eastern Berlin, if you would, and the part that we were supplying with food? Um, 
the Soviet half of that thing must have been in pretty bad economic conditions and, and food conditions. What was the reaction between the people? Uh, it was strained and it was, it was minimal. But we had different um, ration cards for the East Germans and the West Germans. And when the West German, uh, Western sector German ration cards didn't mean very much until we got to hauling in those 7,000 pounds, 7,000 tons a day, the Soviets, time after time, enticed the Western Germans, West Berlin Germans, to come over to the east side and get their ration coupons, which gave them potatoes and flour and a few things like that. It didn't work. The, the um, residents of West Berlin, very, very shortly after it began, said, you know, I think the Americans are going to stay. They're going to do this. Whereas at the very beginning, there was great question mark, I think, in German minds as to whether we would do it or not. And this, this, again, this was something that had never been done before. And the Russians couldn't envisage that this airlift would ever be put together and survive. So um, that was sort of the name of the game. Yes, sir. Let me contribute to... Uh the uh, question that was in the back from uh, one of the ladies and the two on the other side. I spent two years in Berlin, 55 and 56. And I can tell you all that the heroism of these people in that airlift and what they accomplished for the United States and the free world, I couldn't possibly describe. We were not really... Uh, terribly accepted even in France in those days as soldiers. And even in parts of Germany. And remember, it was occupied territory. And yet in Berlin, which was full of rubble, <laughs> a few lights around on the Kurfürstendamm and so forth as time went on. But our, our problem now, frankly, is that the era of those people who went through that and recognized that we literally saved their lives from a horrible experience. Uh, they're there, they've, you know, they've helped us out around the world and so forth, and now our, our uh, politicians have to be sure to get it across to the younger ones coming up through. Sir, we're going to we're gonna have to go on to another question. We have one behind you, please. I have a question about aircraft. Now, when C-54s were just only a handful, of course, C-47s uh, did a lot of the mission. As the numbers of C-54s increased, were the C-47s gradually withdrawn from the airlift? Yes, they were all withdrawn at, at a particular time. And I believe that was sometime in July, or maybe it was early August. All C-54s were taken off because they were a slower aircraft. And this was the problem. You had to schedule a slower aircraft into the higher aircraft. This problem also uh, surfaced with the British aircraft, the York, which is about 15 miles an hour faster than anything we had in the sky. And so they came in on their block time as a discrete set of aircraft, not mixed in with the uh, U.S. aircraft, C-54, which was a slower bird. I also didn't hear about another aircraft, the C-46 Commando. Had that been withdrawn from the inventory at that time? No, but we didn't have any of them in the European theater. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we have time for one more. Sir, you have the last word. In the beginning, when you were looking for aircraft, did you ever turn to the airline industry to help out in that situation, the United States air, air, uh, industry? Air, I really don't know whether that was done or not. The British did that, and the British sequestered a lot of commercial airliners for the airlift. But I'm not sure to what ends the, uh, the U.S. government went uh, in that respect. Uh, Michael, can I have uh, 30 seconds? Sure. Okay. I want to read one thing I meant to, to include. In, in Encyclopedia Britannica, we all know the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the ultimate word in a lot of things. When you go to the um, little section that says Berlin Blockade, the end of the blockade was brought about 
because of countermeasures imposed by allies on East German communications, and above all, because of the Western embargo placed on all strategic exports from the Eastern Bloc. Hogwash. <laughs> There's not one word of truth in this. Not a single word of truth in this. I have no idea who wrote this. He must have been unemployed or something. He needed a job on Secretary of Botanica. And they said, go write something about Berlin Airlift. This had nothing to do with an embargo on strategic goods. After all, they had ports on the, on the Baltic Sea if they wanted to export things. And um, countermeasures imposed by allies on East German communications. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Colonel Burcham, uh, <laughs> this is a pleasure not only uh, to welcome a great scholar such as yourself and veteran, but also especially, as I mentioned, one of our longtime friends here at the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center. Uh, this has been a remarkable story of an incredible mission, and uh, we are thrilled that you've been here to bring it all to life for us. What's very special about your story as a veteran is uh, you can relate this as you experienced it from the cockpit. I think everybody's going to leave here tonight with the cockpit's eye view of, uh, of the Berlin airlift, and it really adds a level of depth that all of us, I think, have needed. So on behalf of the director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Mark Viney, I'd like to present to you this uh, reduced copy of the poster that we use to advertise your oh, lecture. Oh, thank you very much. And our thanks for a, yes. for a very interesting and informative lecture. Um, my daughter said we should get this frame. <laughs> you should. <laughs>